Antoinette Frank stood in the cramped kitchen of the Kim An restaurant, a 9mm pistol clutched in her hand. Kneeling on the dirty floor at Frank's feet were 17-year-old Kwong Vu and his 24-year-old sister, Ha. Kwong was an altar boy at St. Bridget Catholic Church. He played high school football and wanted to be a priest. Ha was considering becoming a nun. Both worked long hours at their parents' restaurant. Frank fired nine bullets into them. Ha Vu died instantly. When detectives found her, she was still on her knees, her forehead resting on the floor. Kwong took longer to die. Frank shot him repeatedly in the chest and back, but his young athlete's heart continued to beat. Frank heard him trying to talk, so she shot him again, this time firing two bullets into Kwong's head. Frank and her partner in crime, an 18-year-old thug named Rogers Lacays, ransacked the Bullard Avenue restaurant until they found what they were looking for. Money. Frank and Lacays bolted through the dining room. On their way to the front door, they passed Ronnie Williams. Williams was a 25-year-old New Orleans police officer assigned to the 7th District. His shift had ended at 11 p.m., and he had come straight to the restaurant to work a security detail. Williams needed the extra money. Ten days earlier, his wife had given birth to the couple's second son, Patrick. Still in his police uniform, Officer Ronnie Williams was face down behind the bar in a pool of blood. He'd been shot twice in the head and once in the back. Lacays had Ronnie Williams' gun and his wallet. Outside, Frank and Lacays piled into a battered 1977 Ford Torino. As the car screeched out of the parking lot, a sun-yellowed cardboard sign fluttered on the dashboard in front of the steering wheel. Printed on either end of the foot-wide rectangular placard was the star and crescent symbol of the New Orleans Police Department. In the center of the sign, between the symbols, were the words, New Orleans Police Officer on Duty. The sign in the car belonged to Officer Antoinette Frank, a New Orleans cop who worked out of the 7th District. She, too, had just gotten off at 11 p.m. Frank was on the same platoon and worked the same shift as Williams. The two officers had worked together every day for more than a year. Few would deny that in 1995, the New Orleans Police Department was in sad shape. The agency was losing about 100 officers per year, many of them fired or arrested, and hiring only half that many. In 1994, two officers were arrested for murder. One for killing a man the officer suspected of breaking into his apartment, the other for ordering the execution of a woman who had filed a brutality complaint against him. Then, in December 1994, the FBI arrested 10 New Orleans cops on federal drug trafficking charges. CBS's Mike Wallace branded New Orleans the number one city in the nation for police brutality and corruption. Mayor Mark Morial told Time magazine, I inherited a police department that was a shambles. By the start of 1995, things were bad, but they were about to get a lot worse. Officer Antoinette Frank, the woman who had become the poster child for police misconduct and the living symbol of a department gone bad, had just met Rogers Lacays. Just past his 18th birthday, Lacays already had a history of violence and drug peddling. His mother, Alice Cheney, kicked him out of the house when he was 17. Rogers had become a dope dealer, she says. At the end of 1994, Lacays got shot. He told police that he and his friend, Nemaya Miller, were hanging out when another friend, a 19-year-old who went by the name Freaky D, whipped out a gun and opened fire on them. Alice Cheney has her own opinion for the reason behind the shooting. It was behind a dope deal, Miss Cheney says. Rogers and Nemaya had just scored. Miller died. Lacays went to the hospital. One of the investigating officers was Antoinette Frank. Frank said she always wanted to be a police officer. Born in Opelousas, she was a member of the Opelousas Junior Police and the New Orleans Police Explorers. When she turned 20, Frank applied to the New Orleans Police Department. Almost immediately, Frank's application ran into problems. The Applicant Investigation Unit discovered Frank had been fired from Walmart and had lied about it on her application. She also scored poorly on two standardized psychological evaluations. The psychologist who reviewed Frank's tests recommended a psychiatric interview. Dr. Philip Scuria, a board-certified psychiatrist, evaluated Frank on 14 characteristics relevant to the job of a police officer. He rated Frank as unacceptable or below average in most. 
In his report, Dr. Scuria wrote that Frank seemed shallow and superficial. He concluded by saying, I do not feel that the applicant is suitable for the job of police officer. Apparently depressed over her faltering job prospects, Frank disappeared. She left a half-baked suicide note addressed to her father at a downtown office building. Her dad filed a missing persons report, but Frank turned up the next day. Less than three weeks later, the police department hired her anyway. After Lacay's got out of the hospital, he started getting regular visits from Officer Frank. She took him shopping for new clothes. She got him a pager and a cell phone. She even rented him a Cadillac. Frank became obsessed with him, Lacay's says. She started driving him around in her police car. She even answered calls with Lacay's and introduced him as her trainee. Two officers from the 7th District once saw Lacay's driving Frank's patrol car. Then, the two of them started hatching a plan to rob the Kim On restaurant. Frank had been splitting the security detail at the family-owned Vietnamese restaurant with Officer Ronnie Williams for months. During that time, the Vu family, who owned the restaurant, grew close to Frank and Williams. They treated Frank almost like a member of the family. The Vus took a real liking to her, Frank's ex-partner says. I mean, they were in love with this girl. They bought her presents for this, presents for that. Anything she wanted, anything she needed, they gave her. Frank knew the Vu's distrusted banks. She also knew they kept all their money in cash. During the weeks leading up to the robbery, Frank acquired a 9mm pistol from the NOPD evidence room. Two weeks before the murders, she reported the gun stolen. Lacaze was with Frank when a police officer arrived at her house to take the report about the stolen gun. Lacaze later told detectives that the report was bogus. The pistol hadn't been stolen. Just hours before they robbed the Kim On and murdered three people, Frank and Lacay's stopped at Walmart to buy a box of 9mm bullets. Frank was on the clock, wearing her police uniform and driving a patrol car. As soon as they heard the explosion of gunshots from the dining room, 23-year-old Cha Vu and her 18-year-old brother Kwok ran and hid in the restaurant's walk-in cooler. Cha slammed the door shut as Kwok killed the lights. The two of them huddled in the cold darkness. Through the glass doors at the front of the cooler and a window overlooking the kitchen, the pair caught glimpses of Frank and Lacay's as they rummaged for cash. They heard shouting, crying, more gunshots. Then, silence. After she was sure Frank and Lacay's had left, Cha crawled into the dining room. Her cell phone was in her purse on a shelf beneath the bar. She saw Ronnie Williams' body on the floor. I saw Ronnie was lying with all the blood around him. That's when all my confidence was gone because the person that protects us was lying right there, Cha later said. Cha grabbed her cell phone and scrambled back into the cooler. She dialed 911 but couldn't get through. She called a friend and begged him to call the police for her. The friend asked what happened. The battery in Cha's phone died. Kwok slipped out of the back door and ran to a friend's house to call police. On the way out, he passed the bloody bodies of his brother and sister. Several blocks away, Frank was fuming. One of the bitches got away, she told Lacay's. Frank had seen Cha and Kwok inside the restaurant when she and Lacay's went in, but she'd lost sight of them and couldn't find them again. After dropping Lacay's off at his apartment, Frank drove to the 7th District. There, she hopped into a patrol car and raced back to the restaurant. She had a second gun, a 38 revolver tucked into the waistband of her jeans. Sergeant Eddie Rance, who supervised the homicide investigation, says, There's no doubt in my mind she went back there to kill the rest of them. Whether that was Frank's intent, she never got the chance. Cha hid in the cooler until she saw police officers in the parking lot. Then she bolted out the front door and dove into the arms of Detective Yvonne Favre. Frank stayed at the restaurant. She caught a break because Cha was so scared she would only speak Vietnamese at first. In the initial confusion at the crime scene, lead investigators Sergeant Eddie Rance and Detective Marco Dema had no idea that the young 7th District officer was one of the shooters. They thought they had caught a break because one of their witnesses was a trained police officer. When the detectives questioned her, Frank told them she had been in the kitchen getting something to drink when she heard gunshots in the dining room. She said she tried to push all the employees out through the back door. Han Kwong wouldn't leave, Frank said. They stayed in the kitchen. Frank told Ranch she drove to the 7th District Station to report the shooting. 
But Frank had a cell phone and a police radio with her. Why didn't she call instead of wasting time driving to the station? Rance asked. Why did she leave everybody, including a wounded police officer, behind? That's when she started talking about Rogers Lacaze, Rance said. Frank wasn't a witness, the veteran detective realized. She was a suspect. I wanted to vomit, Rance recalls. Soon enough, Shaw calmed down and told her story in English. Kwok returned to the restaurant and also told the detectives what happened. Rance and Demma had heard enough. Rance approached Chief Richard Pennington in the parking lot. Pennington, a veteran detective, had been on the scene for a while but was letting the detectives run the show. I told the chief, we're about to book this moron with three counts of first-degree murder, Rance says. Later, at police headquarters, with a tape recorder in front of her, Antoinette Frank confessed to shooting Ha and Kwong Vu in the restaurant of the Kim An restaurant. Her justification was simple. Rogers Lacaze made her do it. The robbery, Frank said, was all Lacaze's idea. He'd been talking about it for a couple of weeks. She just went along with it because she didn't know what else to do. Although ballistics evidence later proved the same 9mm pistol was used to murder all three victims, Frank refused to admit to shooting Officer Ronald Williams. She blamed that murder on Lacaze. Detectives found Lacaze at his brother's apartment in Gretna just a few hours after the murders. It turned out that about 45 minutes after Lacaze left the Kim On restaurant, he used Officer Williams' credit card to buy $15 worth of gas at a station three blocks from his brother's apartment. After his arrest, Lacaze admitted that he went into the restaurant with a gun, but denied that he shot anyone. Frank, he said, committed all three murders. He just happened to be there. Rogers Lacaze went on trial in July 1995. He testified in his own defense. It was a bad move. Against his attorney's advice, Lacaze, a high school dropout with an IQ later measured in the low 70s, pitted himself against lead prosecutor Glenn Woods. Woods is a soft-spoken, contemplative man, but he has a mind like a scalpel, which he'd used to slice people apart on the witness stand. In the battle of wits with Glenn Woods, Rogers Lacaze was severely outmatched. In the end, Lacaze was reduced to blubbering on the stand and begging the jury to spare his life. I did not pull no trigger and kill them people, he pleaded. I don't even know them people. Them people. They had names, and Glenn Woods knew them well. Ha Vu, Kwong Vu, Ronnie Williams. Seeking justice for them was one of the defining moments of Woods's career. They were people. They had a life. They had aspirations. They had dreams, he says. The jury convicted Lacay's of murder and recommended he be put to death. Antoinette Frank went on trial two months later. After prosecutors Woods and Elizabeth Teal rested the state's case, Frank's attorneys threw in the towel. Although they'd subpoenaed nearly 40 witnesses, they didn't call a single one. The jury took just 40 minutes to convict Frank of three counts of first-degree murder. They recommended the death penalty. After hearing the recommendation from the jury, Woods said, it would have been a mockery of justice if Antoinette Frank was to walk away without getting the death penalty. In October 1995, Judge Frank Murillo sentenced Antoinette Frank to death by lethal injection. Lacaze got the same. A month later, a dog found the remains of a human skeleton buried beneath Frank's house. It was the same house she once shared with her father. Frank reported her father missing a year and a half before the murders at the Kim On restaurant. There was a bullet hole in the skull. A decade after the case that rocked the New Orleans Police Department and outraged the city and the nation, much has changed. Under Chief Richard Pennington, the police department completely revamped its hiring practices. It weeded out bad officers and hired good ones. Under Chief Eddie Compass, the healing process continued. Still, as bad as the old hiring system was, in the case of Antoinette Frank, it worked at least initially. The police department had a minimum of four glaring indicators of Frank's unsuitability for the job before they hired her. Lying on her application and pre-employment interview, two failed psychological evaluations, her disastrous interview with the department psychiatrist, her strange disappearance and half-hearted suicide note, all were well known to NOPD before they offered Frank a job. So why did they hire her? 
In the early 1990s, the department was severely shorthanded. They needed anyone who could fit into a police uniform. Crime was ripping the city apart. In 1994, the year before the Kim On murders, New Orleans was the murder capital of the United States. The residency requirements restricted the police department to hiring only those applicants who lived within Orleans Parish. To this day, that policy still prevents NOPD from hiring well-qualified officers who live in surrounding parishes. And in a city that often simmers with racial tensions, Antoinette Frank, as a black female, fit the profile they were looking for. Hiring her allowed the police department to chalk up one more hash mark for their non-existent, never-talked-about quota system. As to why she did what she did, Frank now says it's her father's fault. She claims to have suffered years of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse at his hands. It's a claim she only recently started making. But a psychiatrist who examined Frank in 1995 and again in 1999 said she showed symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder with antisocial features. According to the psychiatrist, Frank exhibits a lack of empathy toward others, a feeling of entitlement, flies into rages, and is manipulative in relationships. Rogers Lacaze has a simpler diagnosis. In a letter from prison, he said, Antoinette is crazy. Hell, she killed her own dad and buried him under her house. After 27 years on the job, Eddie Rance retired. He went to law school and had a spacious office on Poydras overlooking the Superdome. Sometimes he thought about the Antoinette Frank case. She is, without a doubt, the most cold-hearted person I've ever met, Rance said. Prosecutors Glenn Woods and Elizabeth Teal are both in private practice. Teal says the Lacays and Frank trials were the most traumatic of her career. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't personal. In his office, Woods keeps pictures of Ha and Kwang Vu. It's shocking the way they died, he says. The picture reminds him of the evil that exists in the world. Mary Williams, wife of Officer Ronnie Williams, is busy raising their two boys, Christopher and Patrick. She's grown very close to the Vu family. They see each other often. The Vu's owned the Kim On restaurant for a long time, but were forced to close after Hurricane Katrina. Antoinette Frank and Rogers Lacays were now on death row, waiting to die and blaming everyone else, including each other, for what happened. Frank currently resides at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women in St. Gabriel, Louisiana, the only woman on the state's death row. Lacays was resentenced to life imprisonment without parole on December 13, 2019. He is serving his sentence at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola in West Feliciana Parish. Thank you.